thank you very much. Really enjoyed the uh, talk so far. Um, I have to say, this is now coming out time. As a scientist, sometimes we have to admit to things. And the thing I have to admit to today is that I quite like science fiction. Now, I'm sorry about that. I've upset lots of scientists that you can say that. But while Marcus was blowing his own trumpet as a child, um, I was watching and reading things like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but thinking about it in a scientific way. You know, wow, what, but he's got this potion and he's going to drink it and he doesn't know what's going to happen to it. I mean, fantastic experience if you're a scientist. And all things like War of the Worlds and really disappointed when humans won in the end and things like that. <laughs> More recently, of course, things like The Matrix, what are the possibilities there? Not looking at it as just some story, but thinking, how you know, can we get there? Where can we go? And the Terminator, of course. Let's have a little bit from the Terminator. This is a mistake. I didn't do anything. No, but you will. It's very important that you live. This isn't true. How could that man just get up after you did? Not a man. Machine. Terminator. Cyberdyne Systems Model 101. <laughs> Robot? Not a robot. Cyborg. Cybernetic organism. No, he was bleeding. Just a second. All right, listen. The Terminator's an infiltration unit. Part man, part machine. Underneath it's a hyper alloy combat chassis. Microprocessor controlled. Fully armored. Very tough. But outside it's living human tissue. Flesh, skin, hair. Blood grown for the cyborgs. Look, Reese, I don't know what you want. Pay attention! Me. I gotta ditch this car. The 600 series had rubber skin. We spotted them easy. But these are new. They look human. Sweat, bad breath, everything. Very hard to spot. I had to wait till he moved on you before I could zero him. Look, I am not stupid, you know. They cannot make things like that yet. Not yet. Not for about 40 years. So, where are we? Um, <laughs> I want to look at cyborgs, perhaps as we are now and where things are going. Could Terminator be true in the future? What are the possibilities? Well, we're going to look at a few different things, maybe some different types of cyborgs, not just humans' technology, but possibly animals' technology. Here's a, lit, a, a sort of small attempt to the cyborg. This is a very young version of me with dark hair. Having a radio frequency identification device implanted in my left arm. You, I mean, you can try this sort of thing at home. So, um, what it did for me was identify me to the building at, at Reading University. So as I walked around, doors opened, lights came on, it said hello, Kevin, all that sort of thing. Um, great, so myself and the building were sort of one because of this little implant. Now there are all sorts of people that try that. Um, I know, uh, Marcus, you, you, I mean, you're a regular attender in, there's a nightclub in Rotterdam, which I know you go to, called the Bayer Beach Club. I was going to find out. I mean, but to get in there, actually, you can have a little implant, and then you get access to specific areas, and you don't pay by credit card. It's automatically charged to your implant. So it is actually being used. <coughs> Is it a cyborg? Well, let's have a look at some other potential. These are some of my students doing their projects. Um, There's final year students, master students, and so on. What they're having are magnets implanted in their fingers. So this is the guy doing it. You'll see the guy carrying out the procedure. He's got tattoos, and he goes by the name of Dr. Evil carrying out, which creates all sorts of problems because we have to get ethical approval from the university. <laughs> there's, there's a line on it which says, who is carrying out the medical procedure? <laughs> Dr. Evil. <gasps> so there we go. We have to deal with it. So it's all ethically above board. Um, here's a picture of... There we go. I need a magnetic implant. There we go. Um, here's a, a picture of Jawesh, in this case, a student. The magnet's actually implanted. You can see permanent magnets. What we do is put little coils of wire around the finger and then link those coils to different sensors. 
like ultrasonics or infrared sensors. And as the signal is changed, so it vibrates the magnet. So for example, if I had such an implant in now and I pointed it to Aubrey, I would be able to detect how hot he was. Uh, or if he moved closer, I, would feel, or I could check who's the hottest person here, if you see what I mean, in a temperature sense. <laughs> there we go. So different uses of it. Is it a cyborg, different sensory input, etc.? Here's another one, undergraduate student. This is Ashley. What he's been doing is communicating via his tongue in a different way. So sending all sorts of patterns and signals into his tongue to either direct him to go in particular ways or... And the amazing thing is that the speed of recognition when you're communicating via the tongue in this way is very, very similar to the visual. Which, which is amazing. It's much, much faster than the audio input or um, touch or anything like that. Why that is, we don't know. Now, some of you may be questioning, you can see, hopefully, that there are implications helping people with disabilities of one kind or another with this research, but also it's along the cyborg lines that you're giving yourself different means of communication, that ordinary folk don't have, or new sensory input. Clearly there are a lot of ethical problems. And as a scientist, we have to deal with ethical problems. For me, the biggest ethical problem came, Holly and Jessica, you may well remember, and then Ian Huntley, the, the guy who murdered them. Now at that time, and it's happened occasionally since, when children get abducted and, and potentially murdered, a lot of parents contacted me and said, please, we know you're into implants and things like that. Could you come up with an implant such that we could locate our child or children if they went missing? Initially, I said, yeah, we'll look, let's get the technology because it could save lives. However, a lot of children's societies, such as Kidscape, NSPCC, came out, very, no, this is terrible. You are a terrible person. Trevor McDonald did a program specifically saying what a terrible person I was to think of such a thing. So I said, all right, ethically, society doesn't want this sort of thing. Since then, I have said, every time a child gets abducted, I know, potentially, we could have had the technology that found them, that located them. Maybe they would still be alive. But at the same time, society doesn't want it yet. Here's some uh, emails, messages that I got in recently. I just brought them for today. I'm not a scientist or engineer, just a concerned mum who would like to be able to trap my baby in case of kidnapping. These are actual messages that I have received from parents who still want me. So I'm sitting in the middle in terms of an ethical thing. Should I listen to what the parents say or should I listen to what children's society say? What is right? There's, it's not a right or a wrong answer ethically or maybe it is a right and a wrong answer. Completely different cyborg. Little, what looks like ring, black rings on the left-hand side, they call potter rings. In those rings, we take brain cells from rat embryos, separate them, lay them out in the little rings, feed them, make sure they keep moist. When they've grown, because that's what neurons like to do, and connect it up, we link them together with a robot body. So via the little gold electrodes that you see on the outside, we take the sensor signals from a robot, feed those sensors into this brain that's growing, take signals from the brain, feed it back to drive a robot around. And if you want to have a look at this on YouTube, Google rat brain robot, and you see little videos of the things moving around. So what we have is a robot with a biological brain. Typically, it has about 100,000 brain cells, which is, you know, is okay if you're a robot, it's quite good. Uh, what we're looking at, some of what Aubrey was talking about, um, can we figure out what memories are? Can we figure out when the, the culture gets older, what's going wrong, so that maybe we can add stem cells, maybe we can add neurons in there, so that memories are retained and things like that. So it's looking at some of the basics that could help in longevity uh, and healthcare and so on. But also now with ethical questions, we have human neurons. We, we are looking at culturing them in three dimensions, not two dimensions, which will take the number up to 30 million. So we're looking at robots with 
30 million human neurons in them. And then you get questions if they don't have 30 million, they have 100 billion, the same as your brain or my brain. Well, maybe yours. I've probably got fewer because I'm an older guy. But if 100 billion neurons in a robot body, or even more, 400 billion brains in a, neurons in a robot body, you know, are we then into the Terminator scenario? Is it ethically okay for me to uh, create a little Terminator robot if I want to? Um, this is Campbell Aird, who lost his arm due to cancer. And, but you'll see him, I, I, I had to use this to be the first person maybe to use the, the red pointer today. Um, you see him flicking the switch, which operates the robot hand, which is a bit of a waste of time, really. I mean, wouldn't it be better if he could operate the robot hand directly from his brain and feel what the hand is feeling directly in his brain? Surely that's better. But... There's a problem with that, because what it means is that we are going to link nerve fibres, his brain, directly to wires, and effectively back the other way. Brain signals, neural signals, are not just going to be on the nervous system, they're going to be on wires. And sure, for somebody who's lost an arm or lost a leg, we can give them an artificial arm or artificial leg. Therapeutic, that's fine. But if we've got brain signals appearing on wires, we can clip onto those wires and send the signals wherever we want. So what it means is, if we've got that bi-directional interface, then your brain and your body don't have to be in the same place. Now, with the technology, as long as we can do that. You can have your brain here, and as long as you can clip, plug your nervous system into a network, your body could be partly in San Francisco, partly the south of France, enjoying the sun that's there, maybe on another planet, and so on. So it's looking at not just a, a cyborg terminator in the shape of Arnold Schwarzenegger, but a completely different thing, where you have the body actually scattered all over the place, wherever you want it to go, wherever the network takes you. So, practical scientific experiment, what have I been doing, or what have I done along those lines? This was actually taken just down the road at what was then the Radcliffe Infirmary. This is me on the operating, the operating theatre number one, um, two consultant neurosurgeons, and what they were doing was implanting in my left arm, the median nerves uh, in my left arm, this little thing here. This it was called the Utah Array, it's also called the brain gate system. And essentially it was fired into the median nerves and linked my nervous system to the computer. Uh, I've got a sort of highlight from the operation. Um, sorry if you had a, a large lunch. Uh, this, this is my left arm. Um, they put two incisions, then put that tube down my arm. And then the array of 100 electrodes, they pushed down the tube, removed the tube, hammered the array into my nervous system, and then for three months I had array in my nervous system, wires running up my arm, and out onto this connector pad. So it's essentially my nervous system was brought outside my body onto the terminals here. So we could plug my nervous system into a computer, if I went like that, we could pick up neural signals and get them to operate different things. So it's the, the same if the implant was in my brain and I was paralysed, my brain signals could operate pieces of technology and things like that. So, what actually happened? Well, I've got a clip from Discovery TV and we'll see some of the things that I was able to do. One man in tune with technology is the world's first cyborg. Part man, part machine. Kevin Warwick, cybernetics professor at Reading University, England, took a leap into the future as long ago as 2002. For th three months, a silicon chip was implanted into the nerves in his arm. At that time, no human had had an implant of this type before. It was a procedure that until then had only been tested on chickens. Would the body reject it? Would it affect the way I moved or, or my sensory capabilities? I, I could have lost the use of my hand. Could it affect my brain? Ultimately, could have sent me crazy. Kevin was plugged into a computer which monitored the nerve signals from his brain to his arm, receiving and transmitting them as radio waves. 
With the signals from his brain, Kevin could not only turn on lights, he could control a wheelchair. And from 5,000 kilometers away via the internet, he succeeded in getting a robot hand to mimic his own hand movements. His most impressive experiment involved his wife, Irena, also having a chip implanted in her arm. The communication experiment between myself and Irena was vitally important to me. This was the highlight of the whole experiment. Kevin wanted to discover if it was possible for his brain to receive and feel signals from Irena's brain. When Irena first moved her hand, it actually felt like a charge running up my index finger. It was a phenomenal feeling. Literally, every time she moved, my brain received a signal. A few holiday snaps to finish. Um, we, we saw with the, the sensors stimulating the magnets one way of getting different sensory input in. For the experiment that I did on the baseball cap are ultrasonic sensors. The output from those was fed down into my nervous system via the array, via the implant. So with a blindfold on, I was able to move around and detect objects. Essentially, my brain was receiving pulses of current that increased in frequency. Whether there were any harmonics and things in there, I'm not sure. But they increased in frequency dependent on how close objects were. The point is this, as humans, we can have extra senses if we want. Our brains are very, very plastic and they can take on board new sensory input. So if you fancy infrared or ultraviolet or whatever, put your name down, let's go for it. Um, so my wife, uh, she wore some jewellery that a student at the Royal College of Art put together. So uh, this, any guys in the audience, this is what to buy your girlfriend or, or for, for Christmas or whatever it is. The jewellery changes colour from blue to red, red to blue, and it was linked to my nervous system. So either I could operate it by opening and closing my hand, or picture the scene, I'm calm and relaxed, my wife's jewellery is blue, when I get excited, the jewellery starts flashing red. <laughs> she's in a completely different building, no, she's not in the university of me, she's walking around, jewellery's blue, Fine, he's not doing anything he shouldn't. Starts flashing red. What is he doing? And who is he doing it with? So, this was Columbia, New York, Columbia University, where we put my nervous system live onto the internet to control the robot hand back in England. So I moved my hand, robot hand moved in the UK, the robot hand gripped an object, signals were sent back across the internet so that I could feel how much force the robot hand was applying on another continent. And the final part, which for me was the uh, most exciting, my wife had electrodes pushed into her nervous system from the outside, as you do. Uh, <laughs> if you do try it tonight, uh, you'll find it is extremely painful. And uh, a doctor did carry it out. We linked our nervous systems together in the lab electrically. So every time Irena moved her hand, my brain received a pulse. Dick, 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 dick. So it was like a telegraphic communication directly from nervous system to nervous system. So as a cyborg, you have a whole new way to communicate. And clearly, when we're not just looking at nervous system to nervous system connections, it will be brain to brain. That's the next step. That's what I'm working on now thought communication. Just think about it. Colours, images, emotions, feelings, all of those things. We'll be able to communicate rather than this pathetic, trivial, serial coded pressure wave form that we have to at the moment as ordinary humans. So <laughs> the message is, let's go for the future, let's be cyborgs. Thank you.